Uh, I'd ask you to watch uh, Joanna Blakely's Lessons from Fashion's Free Culture TED Talk. I want to kind of go over a few points from it that I think are important because I'm assuming you maybe didn't watch it. <laughs> but you should, okay? We kind of talked about sampling and remixing in all sorts of different industries. But I want to talk about one that's very profitable, which is the fashion industry. Let's just be straight up here. There is no copyright in fashion. Sure, if you put a, an artwork like a howling wolf or whatever on a t-shirt, that's, that's a copyrighted image. Or Donald, not, you know, Donald the Duck um, you know, on a shirt, that's a copyrighted image. But you can't copyright a t-shirt. You know? And the reason why is something like a t-shirt or shorts or whatever, socks, um, they're considered you know, utilitarian. They have use value. Now, it'd be something that could possibly be pat patentable, but at this point, you know, there's not, there's nothing new, you know, there, you know, like, so they also don't want it. So like someone could monopolize the t-shirt. Imagine if one company owned the t-shirt for, you know, 95 years and anybody who wanted to make an actual t-shirt had to license the right to do such. Okay. Um, that's real important. So it brings up this question is like, well, what's the incentive to innovate here? If you, you know, in an industry where you only have, you know, trademarks that you can put on clothing, which are important, and you can patent fabrics and manufacturing processes for clothing, okay, um, but no copyright, what's your incentive to innovate? Why do high end and below all the way down the pole come out with new lines every quarter every season you know um, why do they do that what's the incentive if you can't just sit back and, and and profit off of your work and the real answer is you know fashion changes trends change and the reason why is because there is no copyright because what happens in these industries is for you to have a lead in the market for you to make money you have to innovate it forces you to innovate it forces you to make new things and new lines just imagine you know if if you if that wasn't there we'd be still be wearing like bell bottoms and tie dyes oh wait people are still doing that in eugene um but, but you know what i'm you know what i'm saying there right it's like is like they have to make new stuff to stay ahead in the market they have to be to be competitive you have to innovate Imagine if it was like that in movies or music where, you know, you had a smaller time to profit from your works and therefore, guess what? You had to make actual new music or new movies, you know, and not just do remakes and reboots and relicense stuff and repress stuff. This is what makes the fashion industry interesting and it's a highly profitable industry. There are some copyrights in the European Union and Japan, but basically the the novelty standards of newness what makes something new is so high that very few people get copyrights on, on on clothing okay the interesting thing about fashion is it's open source and it's bottom up so what i mean by open source is listen yo fashion designers can bite and copy you have copyright on your drawings, like the drawings that designers do for clothing lines, but the actual clothing themselves from like the high end ridiculous shit that people wear on runways to the stuff you buy at Forever 21 or Target or whatever, you know, um, people borrow from one another all the time. And it's cool. That's the open source part. And again, like you, like you want to be different. You want to be setting trends and be part of trend setting, you know? And so if you copy someone else's stuff, like, that may not be what's most economically viable for you, okay, as like a, a, a higher end fashion line. That may be what's economically viable for you if you're like making knockoffs for Target because, you know, you just knock off something from the high end and make it mass consumable and you have yourself a, pro a product there. Now, the markets are very different, right? The person buying a $10,000 dress is not the person buying a $100 dress. They're just different levels of consumers. And what, what she means when she says that the fashion industry is bottom up is this, you know, we buy clothes made by companies mostly, right? 
And then we do really interesting stuff. And I don't mean we like me. I mean, look at me right now. <laughs> right? Not me. Um, people who are into having fresh style and looking, looking, looking nice and flossing and stuff like that, they... Um, they buy clothes and then they manipulate stuff. They sew on new sleeves or they, they manipulate the clothing, you know, and they set trends. They're like, oh, I'm going to wear ripped jeans. And then you can buy ripped jeans, pre-ripped jeans. Wow. You know, shit like that. Like, like the consumers manipulate the stuff they buy at the corporate level. Just like DJs, you know, hip hop producers and beat makers and shit do the same shit as they, or mountain bikers, right? They buy corporately made bikes and dirt bikes and use their parts in a, in a different way and then the industries catch on right and try to capitalize off of it same with like disco music and, and stuff so what we have with like um like like fashion is like in cities like la and new york where people are fashionable no one's coming to eugene to see you know how people are wearing their sweatpants and sandals and uh you know pony man ponytails and shit like that that ain't happening you know um no one's coming here you know but people on the streets of new york like fashion designers are looking for what we're we're doing what we're wearing how we're rocking their gear how we're changing it how we're mixing and matching scarves with this that and all that and then they then they then they incorporate that into their lines into their next lines and their next products in their own in their own way so what it means bottom up is like you know, we're setting the trends and then companies are adapting them to make them, you know, mass consumable in so many ways. <laughs> okay. Like I said, knockoffs don't create any market harm because the consumers are so different. Your high-end consumers are not the people. Your high-end shoe shoe consumers aren't the people going to pay less. It's just, just very different, you know. And so what it means here in this industry is thin protection, which means not a lot of intellectual property rights protection forces innovation it forces competition it makes prices lower it makes quality better it makes more options for us and make things better from us you know and that's where it differs with other industries like music movies video games books whatever whatever right where where there's less incentive to innovate in that sense because you can just sit on your catalog and make a bunch bunch of money off that shit forever, a hundred years almost, you know. So um, by having a thin copyright protection, it forces you to to create. Here's just some examples of the knockoffs that that she, uh, you know, she goes over, you know, here and again. There's no there's no market harm. They're just different consumers. In this sense, she basically says that fashion's democratized, that there's no chilling effect. You could start a fashion company, and unless you know, as long as you're not infringing on 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 trademark of any sort, you know, you can start a fashion company. It's democratic, like like that. I mean, um, and that's that's a pretty interesting thing. Is like anybody, you know, obviously there's. There's other elements like you need to have capital, you need to have connections for manufacturing and all that. Now it's very different, but you can you can start a company and there's not much of a chilling effect there because you know you won't get sued. Just unlike someone in the software industry who makes a new app and they put the app out there and they may get sued. You know, um, this culture of copying leads to more innovation and, and 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 more money. You know, it's forcing literally you have to come up with new shit to be you know ahead in the market and to, and to turn a, and to turn a profit she compares um these low copyright industries like the food industry the vehicle industry automotive industry uh, fashion industry to um you know the content industries and she basically says oh shit there's a big hawk <laughs> Sorry, um, ADHD. Um, she basically says, you know, she sh does use this comparison. Look at all the money that food and automotives and, you know, uh, clothing make. And then look at the pathetic revenues that, um, you know, TV and film and music and video games make in comparison. I think that's kind of like a stretch because there's different amounts of necessity. Like we need food. Many of us need vehicles. And spend a lot more money per year on food and vehicles 
um, in clothing than we do on video, hopefully on video games and shit and shit like that. So that's kind of some bullshit in her argument. But, you know, she says that in this way, you know, fashion is a benefit from or open source ideology of copying, borrowing and, 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 and sampling, essentially. And she asked this kind of question is, you know, could this work in under other industries? Could this would we have more and better music, more and better movies, more and better books, more and better video games if people could sample? If people could transform, if there were thinner copyright protections, if, you know, shit didn't last for life plus 70 years or 95 years. Like if you had a richer public domain or if you could just borrow and sample, you know, would we have better music out there? Would we have better creativity out there? Would we have better content? Would we have a more democratic society? And my answer is, fuck yeah, probably yes. <laughs> You know, like things would be better, you know, um, if we we could borrow and adapt versus being afraid of being sued um, for making a new movie or making a new app or, or, or whatever. And I think that's a pretty, you know, important point point to make and something to to really think about is like, you know, we're protecting certain things that are valuable that represent like point zero 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 one percent of the world's creativity. And the rest of all of the creativity over humankind, you know, is is being subjected to those same rules that protect the point zero 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 one percent of creativity, or, or prob probably less, you know. Um, and is that right? And is and is that fair? And is that the way to have a democratic and creative society? And if we had more access to things that we could use creatively or in various ways you know, would society be ultimately, ultimately better? And I, I think the answer is yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's a little bit on Blakely. Um, and, and, and then we'll, we'll talk more about music and sampling.